Hello, SolarPunks. Uh, my name is Charles Velsecki. I'm one of the co-founders of the SolarPunk conference. Yeah, so I'm excited to have the opportunity to introduce Josh Godin. Josh has a wide breadth of professional experience working as a concept artist, illustrator for studios big and small, including that of Ubisoft and Inno Games. Today, Josh shares with us how creativity makes ideas and action collide. Claps in chat to give a warm solar punk welcome to Josh Godin. Hello, hello. Uh, just a quick but uh, huge thanks to everyone involved here today. Um, I feel overloaded with inspiration. Um, in this day and age, that's a pretty rare gift. Uh, and also thank everyone for listening. Um, time is like the it's like the one true commodity, right? And I'm I'm honored that you chose to share it with me. So um, this presentation clocks in at like 29 minutes and 58 and a half seconds. Uh, so I'm going to jump right into it. Let's get into the, the 10 second bio. Uh, a long, long time ago, I did this. That's at Barnes & Noble. It was awesome. Uh, then I did this. That's code. It sucked. Uh, then I did this, uh, which was start all over with art. That was awesome. And then I started doing this, which I thought would be awesome, but it ended up kind of sucking. Uh, and now I do this, uh, which is where I teach. And uh, it's pretty awesome again. Uh, but what I want to talk about is more important than who I am. So I'm going to jump into that. Uh, Solarpunk. Uh, so SolarPunk has a lot of core tenets, right? Uh, things I think we all agree upon is kind of part and parcel in this like inherently humanistic philosophy. Um, within that space, we have our own personal way of uh, identifying with the movement, like individual and comfortable ways of expressing the movement using our, our platforms, our personalities, our talents, all that. Uh, so today I wanna talk about mine, which is creativity, hope, and community. Um, this is where I fit, uh, me as a person and what I bring to the table, uh, it's where I can take my contribution, um, my little tiny contribution, and let it ripple across, you know, kind of like this pond we all float in, right? Um, uh, my path will likely not be yours, uh, but it's my hope that I can help you find your way a little bit. Um, so talking about this was was hard to nail down uh, because um, I'm so close to it, the movement and the project and everything. Um, so I started where it makes sense to start. Uh, this is a tiny, tiny human. His name is Som, which means moon in Sanskrit. Uh, it's kind of a sharp yet tender name chosen by his grandfather, <clears throat> or his fellow Indians would know him, his Nana. Um, uh, I helped make this tiny human, but um, of course he's not mine. He belongs to the world. Uh, I, I don't know if I truly understood that notion until he was born, but um, as I watched the world claim him back ever more with each passing day, um, I sure do understand it now. Uh, I think everyone here has uh, something that, uh, that set uh, things in motion, you know, um, broke the camel's back, let's say. Um, I once said Sylm was a straw. He was definitely like a bale, maybe maybe the whole barn on my back. Uh, but he was the catalyst for my transition towards SolarPunk. Um, and we all had a moment where that one connection became like like kind of a light bulb that um, illuminated the cave and, and stopped us from staring at our shadows on the wall. And uh, I feel like any human might be on the brink of that moment. I really believe that. Um, the question is, can they now find their way out of the cave too? Um, do they even know there's an exit? Um, and I believe, uh, yes, they, they do and they can. Um, it just takes someone pointing towards the tiny light at the end of the tunnel and the seconds before they notice their shadows again, which they always do. Um, not everyone has that someone special. So with my project, I, I try to propose that maybe they could. Um, so this is Lulu. Uh, Lulu is from the future, but not like a super distant future, uh, but far enough along where things have, have happened, you know? Uh, and she's the main character in a picture book series I'm developing called Lulu Needs You. Uh, there are many locations in these stories, uh, which is necessary as, a, as I attempt to address the ramifications of climate change across the spectrum of cultures and societies. Uh, but today I'll focus on her location, which is New York City. Um, it's not quite the uh, New York City we know. Lulu lives in what I call post-survival. Uh, and, and this is a diversion that I take from conventional mainstream storytelling on this topic. And uh, it's important to me. Um, in uh, Lulu's world, uh, there's no collapse in which to posit ourselves as post. Uh, we, did, we didn't meet climate change adversity with like free market solutions or like tech sector margins disguised as innovation or whatever garbage. Um, we didn't meet it separately either. And like bunkers stocked full of guns that could like feasibly cut down a tree. Uh, in Lulu's world, we actually we came together. At least a, lo a lot of us did. Uh, something fundamental to solar punk, in, in my opinion, is presenting a version of the world that's not only plausible, but actually better. Uh, so one half of Lulu's entire purpose is just that, to inspire with possibility, the, the cheese on the rat trap of SolarPunk. 
Um, so I'll be showing some work from the project, project uh, I'm developing, but also I'll be talking a lot about my motivation for why I'm even doing a project. And especially I'll be talking about the struggle that comes with doing a project at all, uh, which has been covered a lot today in various forms, but um, I, I wanna bring it all together and wrap it under the banner of creativity and community and hope, obviously. Uh, and so um, just a side note for creatives, uh, I'll be uploading the entire process of making this project to YouTube and videos, tutorials, all that good stuff. Uh, so if this feels a little thin on the art front, uh, you can pick it up there if you want. Just just find me and I'll, I'll show you. And I would love to help you as well if you want to do what you see here today. So I'm easy to find, just find me. Um, so I don't know if that matters, but um, it's noted, whatever that means. Someone note that. Uh, Onward. So uh, welcome to Lou's Neighborhood. Uh, this is all work in progress stuff. I should note that too. Uh, like the guy in the middle is just like drawn in with flat collar to hold the place until I actually make him correct. Uh, so uh, this is Lou's Neighborhood. Uh, she's currently atop the High Line, which is an elevated greenway running down the west side of Midtown Manhattan. It does actually exist for those not familiar. Um, it's an elevated train line, which uh, was used to deliver goods to the city, but fell into disrepair with the onslaught of highways and truck-based shipping. Um, so it's been converted to a park, which winds between the high rises and community gardens and stuff like that. Um, even now, the Manhattan Park Service is, uh, uses it for growing seasonal plants. Uh, though it's mostly aesthetic, there, there are some actual vegetables and stuff too. Um, and Lulu the, Lulu's World have taken the uh, obvious step, which has converted it into a literal network of community gardens. Um, she's tending to like some typical root vegetables here, but um, it's just one plot of many. Uh, if we head west and maybe like half a block south down the high line, uh, we find the rice paddies. Uh, so rice is growing in the greenhouses on the right there at the tail end of winter, uh, start of spring maybe, and then transferred out to the water bins in May and June, at which point the greenhouse is repurposed for the next temporary crop development. Uh, and the entire highland has been partitioned into these sort of facilities. Um, climate change will make the world a melting pot. Uh, New York City already is. It's going to transfer the entire world into that paradigm. Uh, and so even more so than now. And I think it's important that the, the methods, the traditions, the literal resource needs of the many cultures are represented and honored. So the, the Highline Garden Training Facility kind of uh, serves that need. Um, throughout the city, there are areas repurposed specifically to maintain these crafts and skills. Uh, in the time before Lulu's era, which is of course our time, uh, in the years beyond, we saw firsthand what happened when uh, core abilities were subverted and uh, obsoleted by uh, automation and capitalism. Um, a lesson humanity just loves to keep learning. Uh, I find one of the uh, unique traits of solar punk as a community is retention of tradition uh, alongside pursuit of emergent technology. And I want Lulu's world to really highlight the upsides of that thinking and let it demonstrate how it bolsters us against the collapse of lesser solutions. Um, community is an infrastructure, but, but it's built on knowledge, not, not steel or whatever. Um, so in addition to community service, Lulu is, uh, trains in a more specialized role too, uh, because her New York City is a network of communities. Uh, rather than a rat race of commerce, uh, vocation is reimagined. Um, it's, of course, wholly unconserved profit, uh, profit uh, keeping the community functional within itself and helpful to mankind, the larger fabric of mankind, is the true power of labor here, as it should be. Um, so in the, during the daytime hours, uh, Lulu trains uh, the aquaponics facilities. Uh, just east of the High Line is the meatpacking district currently. Uh, right now, it's like a busy hub of commerce these days. Uh, so these buildings have been gutted and reborn as a literal infrastructure. Uh, resources mostly, distribution, uh, as it was back in the day, uh, but also as areas dedicated to developing technology to further bolster the community against any sort of natural disruption. Um, here we see Lulu Chang, the fish tanks. Uh, there's no fishies in there yet, but I promise there will be, uh, with uh, vertical farm structures rising above and around throughout the room. Uh, this is more for R&D than the max capacity. Uh, if it looks like a server farm, um, that's pretty intentional. Uh, food working at the pace of data sounds pretty nice, actually. Uh, stepping back out the door uh, and flying up in the air, uh, here's a cutaway section of Lulu's neighborhood, one of them, uh, zoomed out from the garden and the aquaponics facility. Uh, as you can see, this area to the west, maybe you can see, is a pretty like moody piece. I said it at nighttime a little more. Um, but the area to the west has been inundated by water, uh, uh, water flow off the Hudson, uh, held behind a tension wall, which is located right here. The high line is right here. Hopefully you see my mouse. Um, and on the north end up there, we have this huge looming giant building, which actually is it's called the Standard. Uh, in Lulu's world, it has been outfitted with uh, magnet gravity energy clusters uh, and uh, sand storage on top. Uh, any excess energy from natural sources is piped to the Standard and these retrofitted external elevators for like construction detritus 
are slowly raised throughout the day, they hold at the top, conserving potential energy, which is generated by lowering them during the height or peak needs or whatever. Um, in general, this was like part of the goal of Lulu to truly uh, understand these sort of technologies. If I were to capture them in a meaningful way, I'd honor the intention behind them. Um, as Lulu presents these solutions, he urges the audiences, uh, audience to investigate. Like, why hadn't they been pursued sooner? I'm like, hint. Uh, who could have pursued them? Hint, hint. Uh, maybe somebody did, but they didn't have enough help. And then like a big theatrical link, right? Um, <clears throat> so the audience may even ask themselves, like, why can't life be like this now? Uh, and I think that's a great question. And like many great questions, uh, it's made better by the answer. And the answer is, uh, it can be like this, actually. Um, so this is Ron Finley. I'm sure you've all heard of him. Uh, he lives in South Los Angeles, formerly the dubious South Central. Um, he got tired of living in a food desert, tired of watching it eradicate his community. Uh, he made a garden in an empty parkway and told everyone, help yourselves. Uh, of course, an issue uh, warrant was issued for his arrest. If he didn't clear out, shocking, right? I thought the walls were supposed to protect us. Uh, not surprising, but also not the point of this particular conversation. He fought the warrant and the city and formed a nonprofit to try to make this a more national effort, right? Um, he's not alone. There's Jason Carr in Michigan. Uh, there's uh, uh, Gary uh, uh, Wozniak at a recovery park in Detroit. Uh, Earthworks Urban Park in Detroit. Uh, the, the list goes on and on. There's a guy in Portland who's uh, making beer by fermenting waste, so uh, more my speed. Uh, I found some of these stories during research for Lulu, and that's a key takeaway about creativity. Ron Finley is a very creative. His outlet is just community plots instead of digital art. Uh, creativity is not like some mythical force, which is cold up through this like ritualistic act, right? It's research and work. It's within the reach of anyone and it self-generates. Um, this becomes paramount, not only in the way that I pursue the world of Lulu, but the way Lulu presents her world back to the audience, right? Um, so in my research, I found like many companies doing exactly what I proposed in my fantastical solutions. Um, in fact, my solutions are just stolen from reality. Uh, this way, if one were looking to find purpose and floundering against like the capital labor grind, might be inspired to manifest these solutions, maybe. Um, certainly sounds more appealing than like shuffling papers for bougie scabs, right? Um, and I, I know solutions within like a broken system uh, aren't the answer in and of, them, like, in and of themselves, uh, but they are a meaningful way and, and a mentally healthy way to put a roof over your head, right? Uh, while, you, while you try to address other concerns. Uh, I have pictured here just a few examples. Uh, since I'm publishing the development process of this project, uh, I wanna show these solutions literally for those who catch on to my winks, they know right where to start. Uh, so we have some like some uh, water power generators. We have uh, the Gravacity uh, gravity drop uh, magnet storage, which is even that tiny one generates enough power to power eight homes for a short period of time. Um, and that's American households, US households. So it's like a whole other country right there. Uh, and the technology itself is actually often quite simple from a visual perspective. Like I'm no engineer, right? Uh, so Lulu's world is built quite literally using Blender. Uh, which is a 3D program for PC and Mac. Um, here's a screenshot. This is in Blender. You can see on the right, there's like a file structure and some, you know, uh, some uh, options and stuff. Uh, and even if you are not a painter, it's entirely possible to, to really build out these things by hand. Like I used YouTube tutorials and experimentation to learn, which anyone can do. Um, also is 100% free and open source, which perfectly aligns with the general ethos of, of Solarpunk. Uh, so by researching solutions, investigating the literal design, and then building them in this like rudimentary ad hoc stylized form you see, and then sharing the entire process. My, my hope is that uh, people who mistakenly believe they can't do the exact same thing will sit up in their seats. Uh, and again, creativity is a, is a choice. I, I may have been creative with my approach or art direction or whatever, but 99% of my, my quote unquote creativity is research. Uh, if we have time at the end of this uh, presentation, I'll pull up Blender and we'll, we'll walk through this world so I can show you. Um, so uh, back to the topic. Uh, all, all of my fiction is based on like interplay with reality. The idea of, wait, could that actually work? If not, why not? And, and down the rabbit hole you go, right? Uh, but, but there's an important side note here. I'm, I'm confronting actual threats with these solutions. The, the threats may be theorized, but the goal is not to predict the future. The, the goal is to present the parallel climate breakdown uh, because that is coming. And then be fantastical with my solutions for how we as a people confronted that peril. Um, Throughout this project, I took like sci-fi liberties to make the setting aesthetically interesting or whatever, um, but it's all just cheese on a rat trap, right? Uh, the audience either knows or they will know through Lulu, this is not imaginary. Uh, sci-fi green city, sure, 
fantastical currently, except in some parts of the world. Uh, <clears throat> rising waters, climate refugees, skyrocketing temperatures, uh, permafrost melt, releasing all sorts of terrible, uh, unknowable feedback loops, tying into perilous spiral downward. Uh, this stuff isn't fantasy, it's, it's happening. Um, even in the midst of this presentation full of like fun imagery and little Lulu, um, it still feels awful to remember that these things actually are happening. Uh, imagine again, the very first time that you were sitting with these realizations, right? It sucks. Uh, fantasy is fun, but um, reality persists. It won't stop persisting. And to me, that, that's a reason why, like, to kind of like straighten up and, and, and feel that backbone and hold you against it, right? It's, it's coming. It's not going anywhere. But neither are you, right? So, I mean, that sounds kind of badass, like to step against the unstoppable and say, like, well, welcome. Welcome to the line I hold. Would you like some of my middle finger? Right. Uh, but it doesn't really feel badass, uh, especially when we aren't feeling up to the task, which, which we often do not, uh, as I don't, um, especially from the perspective of my target audience, which is younger, and just plummeting into the actual full scope of it, the, the darkness that can be, um, it can kind of overwhelm. And, and I think some of us, because we're here, we've learned to put on a face or deal with it, a role play or, or whatever, we have healthy balance. Um, but the fact is underneath somewhere there's, there's trauma. Um, it's a trauma, it's traumatic, and it leaves damage behind every single time you let it in. And it will come in. That's just what it does. Little peekaboo. Uh, and this is where Lulu started, speaking of hope. Uh, from the very first drawing in a tattered sketchbook to experiments with personality and style, a fluffy, fun, wholesome little thing, she, she romps through the apocalypse, right? I pictured her as an avatar of experience, like this innocent goof, the subject of a kid's book, about like a, maybe a post-collapse, right? Um, hope personified as a persistence in human survival. Um, at this stage, I was picturing it as a project much younger children, not much older than my son, who was only two at the time. Um, the goal, of course, was to grab the parents, to put it in their mind that their child could one day be in Lulu's place at the rate we're going. Uh, kids would love like roaming this colorful wasteland. Uh, I gave Lulu like a little robot sidekick as a personification for the reader. And I even mocked it up, like in a little app. Zoom. Reveals the prior age with his, with his AR geolocation tech. Zoom. And that's, that's a thing you can learn about that's, that's now gone because of suits off screen. Um, <clears throat> that's the thing you can investigate now. You know, now that you know about it, you can talk to your parents and, and have a whole discussion. Uh, very rudimentary app, obviously. Uh, my sitting in a location kind of remote to capture that, you know, youthful adventure, Calvin and Hobbes kind of thing. My own youth, I grew up in Montana. Um, <clears throat> parents would get it. They would see their world crushed uh, under the collapse that Lulu just kind of skips across now. Uh, the books would have resources and information. What can you do? How can you talk to your kid? Um, how can you uh, help this process and, and fight against it? Um, it's obvious now what I was really doing well, with the first in the project, uh, which I was a new parent, I was reading a lot of information about this, the subject. Um, I was stuck in the opulent playgrounds of Silicon Valley, listening to Tesla dads talk about stock. In my mind, I was coiling like a viper. Um, with this version of Lulu, I was like clearly addressing my own grief. I was mourning my own child's future, right? Maybe it was just escapism. Um, I discarded that version. Uh, I made many other versions, many other incarnations. I aged Lulu up, maybe throwing her at teenagers would catch them with the, the pre-college years where they could be open to influence. Um, but what was I presenting? Uh, it's still just trauma. Uh, it's a pretty paint job on a car with no brakes. It doesn't, it doesn't accomplish anything. Uh, I started working on paying gigs again at this point. Uh, since before all this, I left my job to be a stay-at-home dad and work on this project. Um, my wife and I started plotting and moved to New York City, our, our lifelong love, but a complicated endeavor. Uh, it started to get harder to see Lulu at all. I, had, I hadn't found her, um, much less the right version. And as often happens, uh, life hid creativity under like a long shadow. Um, research was inundated by keeping up with like the here and now, finding a school in New York City, school shootings, Trump, Floyd, DNC sabotage, school shootings, again, COVID, war, blah, blah, blah. Um, I started to feel kind of hopeless, which is ironic, um, intending to manifest hope in others and instead reflecting my own lack of hope right back at me, which subverted the process of finding hope again in the first place. Uh, but with that realization, it kind of all came together with that futile gesture. It kind of all, it just made sense all of a sudden. Uh, I, I, it didn't matter if I could see Lulu or not. What needed to happen was uh, Lulu needed to see me, 
that was what actually needed to happen. Um, so I've been referring to this confrontation with climate change as sort of trauma. Um, I think as a movement, solar punk has a really healthy way to confront that trauma for sure. Uh, people I meet have this balance of like swapping frantically between like screaming into the maw and then just slapping it shut back and forth. Um, but our movement is small and people haven't really heard of it yet enough. Um, most people don't have a healthy way to get out that trauma. Um, and without a way to get that venom out, it, it turns inward instead. It becomes ever more poisonous. Um, anyone who's trying to handle trauma alone knows this like awful cycle. Uh, I often feel like we're, we're ghosts um, haunting the future of our parents' youth. Uh, we can scream at them all they want, but they're never going to hear us. They're never going to do the right thing. Uh, and as I started to think about that, Lulu's role became painfully obvious. Uh, she needs to see us and listen. Um, I didn't, dynamic we uh, never could have shared with our ancestors and their youth. Uh, so Lulu must be like a scavenger of memory, like a, a, a trauma archaeologist, right? Uh, and the story of climate change rolling out is uh, at once our, our life right now and her history. Um, and this is how I started to see uh, Lulu as a voice of hope who can comfort us from a space where we as a people came together, where the trauma resulting from being unheard never happened because we were heard, right? Uh, Lulu must be permission to hope granted by the mere fact she exists. Uh, by listening, Lulu frees up within us the space for hope to fill. And I find that hope and inspiration are like water. Um, that they'll conform to any space completely if allowed. Uh, this was the ignition point for, for Lulu and this whole project. Um, I structured her life around a dual role. By day, she's serving in her community, training on vertical aquaponics farms and stuff like that, uh, learning how to manage and distribute resources. By night, she's working for you. Uh, her evenings are spent exploring our present, yours and mine. Um, she does so by, by haunting the empty streets of this abandoned corporate city centers, sniffing out old electronics with the aid of like a scavenger bot tuned to the, the scent of maybe like decaying silicon, laptops, phones, the rarest of all, a first-gen iPod with like a functional hard drive. Uh, she takes whatever she can, brings it home, and sets about extracting our experience from the, the, the muddy little motherboard guts. Um, little by little, she learns the story of a society facing climate peril. She listens to those stories. She daydreams them, which I visualize in the novel. Uh, whose stories are they? They're ours, uh, yours and mine. She's the ghost haunting our future, speaking back through time to us directly. Uh, and what a fortuitous coincidence. She lives in a world which borrows technology from the present to bolster a sustainable future, which literally and directly addresses precisely the concerns raised by the story she scavenged from us, right? By her example, by the reality she inhabits, she shows us a better way, and it's beginning now. It, it is, exists now. There's just no one to do it yet. Uh, not enough people anyway. Um, so we unload this trauma on her, and she listens, and she offers a glimpse of what could be. It's a one-two punch of swords, uh, and uh, exhale venom, and inhale hope, All right? Um, <clears throat> now, I could uh, easily invent these stories, right? Uh, but that's such a missed opportunity. Uh, Lulu's future may be imagined, but the history it explores is not. It's literally us happening right now. Um, if we tell our stories, well, well, what's left to fill that space opened up by uh, letting those words kind of punch their way out? Um, it's a Lulu story. Uh, she discovers our stories, honors them, and then shows how we as a species move forward together, despite many very valued concerns. Um, it may not have went perfect, but in Lulu's word, we'll still hear. Uh, she's us generations from now. Um, so I collected stories from friends, uh, but next month I'm going to open it up to the public so anyone can come along uh, and submit their story. Um, and along with some guerrilla marketing stuff here in New York City on the streets, uh, these stories I'll tell directly through Lou as she reads them from these scavenged devices, which are the things you're holding your hand right now, right? Uh, and so we're talking about community now, as you can see. Uh, solar punk as a philosophy, as a technologically mature yet biome respectful movement, it has answers. What we need now is critical mass, uh, action numbers. And if you're a single solar punk in your town of 2000, I bet it feels pretty daunting. I've been there. Um, you know what feel less daunting? A friend. Uh, in a town of 2000, a second solar punk is monumental. Um, so the next step, uh, it's us. Uh, all this, everything I've talked about thus far is just the sweet smell uh, but what we want is the pollen and community community is the pollen. Uh, if you're struggling with your next steps, uh, it's really important to face a really simple fact that nothing 
is ever that thing which just provides you with your purpose, right? Not my little slideshow, not anyone's little slideshow. Um, but the fact is you do have a purpose. Uh, you have a role to play and it's a uh, very, very clear role. It's literally in your role. So if you know your role now, like that's, that's awesome. Suit up, hit the street, uh, great. If you don't, also fine. Uh, you know why? Because someone's role is to find your role. Right? Someone in the community, that's what they do. They help people find their space. There's so much to do in the community that a bunch of people's role is just to assign people those tasks. Um, that's what community is, right? On some level. Uh, that's why the goal is community. In fact, community is all there is. Uh, we're up against like kind of something unfathomable and insurmountable. Uh, and what are we supposed to do? Like a gaggle of geeks against military industrial complex, against the most redundant phrase ever, crony capitalism. Uh, which is just capitalism, uh, we're the thing which doesn't collapse, right? That's what we offer. Uh, if society comes crashing down, community remains. If it doesn't come crashing down, community remains. Uh, our infrastructure is, is not physical, it's knowledge. And our method is each other. That doesn't go anywhere. So we're, uh, climate change may, may seem insurmountable, um, but so are we. That's the true power of it. Um, so me, my, personally, my skill set is art and storytelling. Uh, my role is to spread the word of this movement um, that I true I do believe in, right down to my like dark little mad sad core. Uh, my goal is to let Lulu be the tunnel, uh, the, the light in the tunnel. I'm sorry, that brings others to the movement, into the fold, and then back out into the world, right? Uh, and there's there's more plans for how I want to do this literally within my project, but the the, the overall goal is that um, one more body doing anything it can to hurl itself against the wall of the unstoppable. That's the goal, right? Uh, and to reach my goal, uh, I need you, basically. Uh, so that's, that's the, the general presentation. I have like just enough time to like pop up the world so we can like kind of see it in action too, which I think is pretty cool. So this is Blender. Uh, so as, in regards to artists, I try to save just enough time to talk to you directly for a second. Um, there's a lot of ways you can approach this. Uh, and I think that a lot of people got hung, uh, hung up on the idea that, that they have skills to work on. Um, that doesn't matter. Like everything that I showed today is a work in progress uh, and none of it actually represents what I feel I could do, but it doesn't matter because I'm doing it. It's going out there in the world. It's generating something. People are seeing it, right? Uh, if you can't draw at all, there's Blender. There's other programs like Blender. Uh, there's other solutions you can do. Uh, but this is a little chunk of Lulu's world, right? We're seeing it in kind of a flat matte grayscale, not wireframe, but just flat. Uh, I cut out a lot of the rest of the city because I don't want you to watch me catch on fire as my computer tries to stream it in real time. Uh, but this is this is a little chunk of it, right? So simplified view, we can then turn on materials. So we can see colors, they'll load in in a second, right? And then we can go a step further and we can turn on light. Right? So we have a sun we can change, we can change the time of day, all that good stuff. Uh, and if you're like kind of averse to like, maybe you're, you just don't understand perspective or drawing and things like that, uh, Blender can help you with that too. So these little things are cameras, right? Hopefully you can see them, they're very small. Um, but once I select one, I can jump into the view of it, right? And then when I hit a certain hotkey, I can take control of the camera as though I'm running around with it, right? Uh, so all these resources, like I built them because I enjoy that, but you can get these for free. These are free everywhere. Go to 3D Squid, go to anything and say, give me free stuff. It's out there. You can do this yourself with free stuff and much faster, right? And then run your little camera around. Like, okay, I need to go down to this warehouse shipping area. Uh, that's where a moment in my story happens. Come down, drop a camera, click it, retitle it and say shot number, whatever. And go from there, duplicate it. And then you head right back into it, leave that camera where it was onto the next shot, right? Uh, so this idea of like, I don't really know what I'm looking at. I don't know how to draw things. I don't know the perspective. I, I just don't anything. Just set up a scene with three assets and be a director. It's all it's all free. Uh, one quick question popped up. Uh, my name is Ami. I'm also a visit artist who absolutely treasures research and authentic storytelling. I want to ask the best advice on practicing, on note taking, or how you record interviews. I want to start a large project that I hope to get lots of guidance and consulting for, but trying to decipher best ways for open resource information, but organized. Um, I would record it. Uh, if you're doing interviews audio, uh, 
uh, I would absolutely record it. And then there's a lot of uh, free tools for transcribing it. Uh, that's the easy part. Um, you can also, uh, um, but you can, as far as organizing, I use Evernote. I have thousands of pages of Evernote. Um, it's really easy to search and use. So that's the one I use. But uh, some type of tool where you can organize uh, notebooks and within the notebooks, actual notes that you can drag and drop and edit infinitely and it's stored in the cloud. That's that's like the real change maker for organizing a project. So uh, Charles, if you wanted to answer, go ahead. Sorry, I'm just clicking on it. So that way we can clear it once you're finished. Oh, Thank okay, you. cool. All right, cool. So I think that's exactly my time. Um, again, I'm uh, the actual process of generating these assets and the world building and all that good stuff and the art direction and coming up with style, all that kind of stuff, uh, are huge, huge topics that like I teach long classes on. Condensing it down is like kind of a futile affair. Uh, so I'm gonna put that all on YouTube for free. And if that is particularly your interest, you can go there and, and learn all you want, ping me on Instagram, ping me on whatever, and I'll help you with whatever you need. Um, this talk, I really wanted to focus on kind of finding your role in the community, remaining creative, and keeping hope generated, which is a bit of a superpower.